JP here. This is our November 2024 JP Aerospace update. In addition to the balloon flights and a new airship, we've been working on Mars sample return, artificial intelligence, ship control systems, flowers at the edge of space, a submarine, and adventures in our new off-road tank chase vehicle. In addition to that, we've done a major update to the Airship to Orbit program. And let me tell you, it has been a busy year. I'm going to show you all of that, and then I'm going to show you what's coming up next. At the end, I'll give you a sneak peek of the new Airship to Orbit animation we're working on that shows how all these pieces fit together. Okay, let's get started. This year, we introduced the H1. The H-1 is the latest configuration of the Orbital Ascender airship. It is the centerpiece vehicle in the Airship to Orbit program. It's not really a new vehicle, but rather a refinement of a concept. As we develop the engines, work the wind tunnel, and fly the prototypes, the design gets refined. Old systems are adjusted, the aerodynamics work through, and the vehicle evolves. But you can't update the drawings every day. You save them up, and when there's enough changes, we update the overall configuration, make new drawings, and new sets of models. That's what we did with the Orbital Ascender airship. The new configuration is called the H1. In addition to the pages and pages of little things, there are two big changes from the earlier configuration. First, we moved to fewer but bigger engines, moving away from the more and smaller engines. We made this change based on the great data that we're getting out of our engine test program. The second big change is in the airfoil. That's the shape of the wing's cross-section. The shape is designed to meet the needs of holding enough helium for buoyancy and the hypersonic speeds the airship will be moving. Now we're in the process of updating the Stage 1 airship. We call it the Load and the Dark Sky Station. Watch for those updates. It's time for the shameless promo. These programs cost money. One of the ways we pay for it all is through Patreon. Patreon is a membership service a bit like gym membership. You can sign up to donate $20, $5, or even just $1 a month. It really adds up, and it keeps our space program alive. Patreon gives you the added benefit of being the first to get news and updates. There's a link to our Patreon site listed below, and you can check it out. And to all our existing patrons, a heartfelt thank you. Our life support and artificial intelligence test vehicle, the submarine Bellavia, is finally operational. You know, telescopes have what's called first light. This is the first time they look out into the sky. Airplanes have their first flights. And boats and ships, like our sub, have their first launch. And we had ours. We are pretty jazzed to finally get the submarine in the water. We've done two in the water tests so far. One with sandbags as weight instead of a person. This was to make sure she floats. And to check trim, that's making sure she wasn't nose heavy or tail heavy or listed side to side in the water. We had a cable to an external control box that let us test the emergency ballast blow system. It was amazing just to see Belle floating in her element. Of course, it was also our first time launching her off the trailer and then recovering her back on trickier than you might think. We've all seen those countless boat launch accident videos. We did not want that to be us. I was the worry ward about it all, but the practice sessions with just the trailer paid off and the team had it down. 
on the first test, everything went great. However, we did get a slow leak in two port forward ballast tanks. This caused the sub to tilt to the left after about 20 minutes. You can see the list in this picture. Afterwards, we removed all the ballast tanks and redid the seals and then pool tested all of them. We had to replace the access hatch seals on two ballast tanks and replaced all the vent seals for good measure. We dunked them in the pool till not a bubble could be seen. Then it was back to the lake for the first crude test. This not only was the first test with me on board, but it was the first time in the water with all the systems powered up and running. We arrived at the lake at 6.30 a.m. and the team jumped into action running through the checklists. Very much like our balloon flights, with one team filling the balloon and another team prepping the flight vehicle. In this case, we have the outside the sub checklist and the inside the sub checklist. If all goes well, the two teams arrive at hatch close at the same time. After that, it was my job just to sit patiently inside while the launch team puts Bell and I into the water. Once in the water, we put the sub through its paces. Main thrusters, rudders, vertical thrusters, life support, bow systems, emergency blow, the works. We came away from the test with about two pages of to-dos, which is kind of the point. The purpose of the sub is to teach us how to build spaceships after all. The sub put us right into the nitty gritty of human vehicle integration. We're just about done with those two pages of to-dos and we're about to have the sub back in the water for round three. The airship needs propulsion. Work continues on our plasma chemical hybrid engine. This right here is magneto hydrodynamic test firing number 132. The MHD firing series tests one aspect of the plasma engine, the magnetic field interaction with the plasma. In our earlier tests, we measured the plasma interaction by measuring the voltage across the electrodes in the middle of the magnetic field embedded in the engine. However, in this test, we ran it the other way around. We ran 40,000 volts into the plasma while it was in a 0.6 Tesla magnetic field. And that's Tesla, the unit of magnetic field strength, not the car. This is the start of the next phase of our engine program, increasing the thrust by increasing the electrical power in the engine. The test went really well in that everything worked. However, the downside, it showed us that our sensor system monitoring the test sorely needs an upgrade. We are now in the process of rebuilding and replacing all of the sensors and the data logging system. The next step will be a series of firings to calibrate everything and then it's on to stepping up the power. Mars sample return proposal. You know, you've seen in the news where NASA is staggeringly over budget and years over schedule on their Mars sample return program. This is where they're attempting to bring a tiny bit of Mars back to Earth. Because of the billions of dollars and years overdue, NASA sent out a request for bids to see if anyone had any new ideas on how to do it cheaper and faster. As a rule, I don't bid on NASA grants. However, some folks suggested that we bid for no other reason than to shake them up a bit with some new ideas. I think they wanted me to propose something completely wild. Well, we threw our hat into the ring to do just that. We wanted to challenge their notion of what could be done and shake them up a bit. So I proposed doing sample return from Mars with a weather balloon. To keep costs down and to do it fast, we based it all on off-the-shelf systems that I have in the shop right now. 
balloons, and a cheap spin-stabilized rocket. Specifically, I would use our tandem twin balloon airship along with our two-stage ML rocket. The rules were simple. NASA would get us to Mars, and the European Space Agency would get us from Mars orbit back to Earth. We had to handle everything in between. This is a peek on what that would look like. After a rocket flight to Mars, our tandem airship is deployed from a Mars re-entry aeroshell. The tandem would locate and dock with the Perseverance rover that collected the samples. Tandem would then climb high into the Martian atmosphere. It would then lower the two-stage ML rocket in its launch box. The two-stage ML rocket would carry the samples to Mars orbit. The European Mars Return Orbiter would then retrieve the sample container and carry it back to Earth. You know, unexpectedly, I actually got excited by it. It was well within the capabilities of all the vehicles and was so cheap, you could actually do it multiple times at a fraction of the current budget. However, NASA was not amused. NASA rejected our proposal, citing two things. First, that we had no operational Mars experience, and second, that the concept had not been tried before. This was in spite of their stated purpose of the program, was to find new out-of-the-box ideas from organizations new to Mars. Oh well, that's NASA. We are putting together a separate video on the concept of Mars sample return with a weather balloon. It'll go deeper into the concepts and the systems. Watch for it soon. You know, I wonder, if we should just do it anyway. This is the Argo. You know, we fly in the high Sierra. Recovering our vehicles after landing is a huge effort. Sometimes it's as big of a job as launching them in the first place, if not bigger. We are always adding new tools to the chase. The Argo is an eight wheel drive land and water go anywhere ATV. We found a 1987 model for sale that had been completely restored and a cabin added. It was in Oregon, so off we went. It was in great shape, so we loaded it on the trailer and brought it home. We got it back, and now we needed to do some modifications. This particular Argo was set up to run in the snow with a great system of moving the engine heat into the cab. We're typically running in 110 degree desert conditions, so we had to change all that. We also added blowers to keep the engine cool. We wanted it quieter, so we replaced the entire exhaust system and also moved it up and over the top of the vehicle. We're often in heavy brush, and we wanted the exhaust well clear. The Argo can run with or without tracks. The tracks are great for mud and snow. The tracks also make for drifting on asphalt. On rough and even terrain and on steep hills, the bare wheels are the best. We finally used it on a real mission for the recovery of the Away 135 balloon platform. Here's the Argo and crew returning after a successful recovery. Art at the edge of space, take three. In September, we flew three balloons to the edge of space, each carrying bouquets of flowers and exotic plants. We have been working with the amazing flower artist Motoko Azuma since 2014, filming his creations with the earth and space in the background. The artist creates the flower arrangements, his team adjusts the cameras for the precise look that they're after, 
and then our job is to gently carry cameras and flowers up to 100,000 feet. Along the way, the magic happens. The best part of the whole mission is the fusion of the JPA team and the Japanese team. You know, it's 3 a.m. on flight morning. Everyone is exhausted from the last two days of prep and on edge because it's showtime. Somehow the language barrier drops away and everyone lands on the same page and the full team is in the zone. In two hours, we've put three balloon vehicles in the air. By the end of the next day, all three vehicles have been recovered along with 11 cameras with amazing footage. The artist is still sorting the images and the video. There's documentaries, music videos, and art installations all planned. As soon as they put it out there, I'll post links to it all. I can't wait to see it myself. What's next? We have high altitude operations, the Ellipse airship, the engine work, and continued testing of the submarine. We ran into a case this year of having just too many projects going on at once. This impacted the Ellipse airship, the helium production project, and the supersonic wind tunnel tests. We're moving ahead with all of those projects this winter. The Ellipse is a 30-foot V airship. Its purpose is to work out the details of the new inflated internal structure. It's getting close to completion, but it needs a solid two more months before it's ready for testing. Then we'll take it to our Area 42 flight test facility and put it into the sky. What is in-house helium production? There are six parts per million of helium in the air all around us. We are working on extracting it from the air. In fact, that's how the industry gets neon. Getting helium out of the air actually is well known. The problem is that it's expensive. That's why nobody does it. We think we've found a cheaper way to do it. We've done two test runs so far and produced one half liter of helium. Our next step is to scale up production enough to do a small balloon flight with our own helium. We are starting a new flight series. We've had several different series of high altitude vehicles. We've flown the Comet series, the Mesospheric Explorer series, Tandem, and our longest running series, Away Missions. We're still flying those, but next year we'll be adding to the mix the Odyssey balloon vehicles. Odyssey missions will be used to develop advanced operational abilities at the edge of space. The submarine, plasma engines, balloons, helium, airships, wind tunnels, they all feed into the airship to orbit program. With so many changes, we've updated the animation of how it all goes together. Here is a sneak peek. We'll have the full video of the animation with a lot more details up soon. Watch for it on our channel. Till next time, thank you for watching. JP Aerospace, America's other space program.